I think we were very excited to get an email from Jacques Herzog, and um, that was pretty pretty interesting. But then there was a kind of long silence after that, and so we had kind of dismissed it. We initially thought it was um, we thought it was a competition in the beginning, so we were hoping that yeah we would be selected. And then the next email in January was um, from Fake Design, and um, yeah, and there, there it was clear that it was 100 architects doing 100 with us. But then we weren't uh, we were familiar with Ai Weiwei, but didn't realize that the architectural uh, right. his studio was called Fake Design. So uh, that threw us off for a minute, but we were quickly made aware of that, that it was uh, Ai Weiwei. And and so then, uh, I think once you have Herzog and Miron and Ai Weiwei working together, I, I mean, you, yeah, you're not going to say no. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to be a part of the team. <laughs> we knew um, of his artwork, but not so much about, again, about the planning and architecture. I didn't really. We didn't know about that at all. There was a project that he did similar to the Ordos 100 with uh, a group, smaller. yeah, a smaller group um, with these pavilions in China. Uh, so that was all uh, new uh, to us. So I think that uh, the viewing of Ordos um, through Weiwei's uh, previous work in a way fits. He's interested in a reverence in a way in the experiment. He's an instigator. He likes to set things in motion and is not so much concerned with the result of with it. That, yeah, with the like with the result as, as positive being positive. He's he's more interested in setting up the experiment and seeing what happens. And there's I think for him there's no such thing as failure. Even like anything that happens somehow makes it more interesting. That it's like the um, this piece that he did for the documenta that then collapsed in the storm. And yeah, he thought it was actually then a lot more interesting than, than before. So even failure adds to, adds to the project. Our, our work is, uh, I mean, one of our, when we describe our working methodology, it's all about um, working in, with the constraints of the project, that we embrace constraint, that we um, we produce multiple options uh, based on the project constraints. So when released from these constraints, uh, it feels like a little insecure, a little naked um, uh, without that. So I think there we had to embrace the constraints that we did have, which was the climate, the tightness of the the master plan and the tightness of the lot. But then, in the absence of a client, we, we, uh, we ourselves, the studio, became the client. So I think it was the, the kind of studio collective programming uh, that uh, we relied on when we were in need of uh, some resistance, that we would provide that for ourselves through our own desires. So that helped with all that project. It was basically we were given the constraints of um, the material choices of concrete and brick, um, which actually limits it quite to quite some extent. And we, we chose to um, use concrete. Um, and then there was one um, one comment that we got from the from the engineers in China that it's um, usually it's everything's rather oversized to to here, so we kept that in mind that um, yeah we shouldn't we shouldn't make anything too tight um, to allow for for dimensions to get bigger. In in a way, it had more, less to do with China specifically, and more to do with the distance between us. That the mm -hmm. even on a project. Uh, that we do up on 14th Street, uh, which is just a few blocks away, uh, we can quickly lose control if we're not on site quite often. So I think we had to not design ourselves into a box where the 
the architecture was overly reliant on detail. But uh, I also want to say that there's a kind of misconception about technologies available in China, and people were asking uh, questions like, uh, what, is, "What is the biggest crane available in China?" Yeah, how big how big are the cranes in China? Yeah. You know, and we wanted to say, it "Well, how how big a crane are you going to need?" I mean, um, for for a villa. We're not building. I mean, you we're see not building yurts. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. It's a kind of a ridiculous uh, supposition that somehow we're so much more advanced in our building technologies than China. So I think it was more about the availability, ready availability of materials other than brick and concrete um, that made them uh, impose those restrictions or request those restrictions. But I also think it might be the saving grace of the project that um, prevents it from being too diverse uh, a project. But one thing we were keeping in mind is that it's the that it's these one hundred villas, and what we are what we are trying to avoid is that it's these follies that each one is so yeah so distinct from the other. And um, what one thing was to um, we decided to keep as tight as possible to that uh, to the given master plan um, in order to somehow in order to keep with the experiment. I think part of the constraint for us not only with the climate but also the smallness of the, the individual lots and the barrenness of it and although there's a tremendous greening project going on in that region uh, that helps control erosion that has kind of ravaged the desert the desertification of that uh, what usually what previously was um, meadows um, so there's a, a, a good deal of planting and landscaping efforts going on but we have such a confined space, so we really wanted to make, to have a great impact of landscaping on our small lot. And we had one of the smaller lots. So we, we, in our scheme, created three courtyards and drew those in to the space of the house proper and allowed those three uh, landscape uh, areas, those three light courts, landscaping courts, to actually shape the space of the house within. And then rather than uh, actually stratify program, i.e. what was really suggested by the program, which was a kind of servants layer, uh, a kind of public, more public layer, uh, and then on top a bedroom layer. Uh, we had an idea about a kind of uh, playing off on the, a situationist uh, derive, the idea of the derive that is a domestic derive, one where uh, unconsciously you go from different kind of space to different kind of space from kitchen to bedroom to living room to study and without regard to levels so even the stair in that regard is almost conceived of as a room it's very large that you can you almost feel like you're occupying that space as well design phase is not really over for us. We submitted the design documents, but it's still, for us, it doesn't really stop there. And we hope we were assured and we hope that we will have some um, chance to communicate with uh, with the ones that are actually setting up their construction documents. I know the first night when everyone was putting the massing all together, we were a little frightened to be yeah. um, honest about it because we were just uh, surprised at the some of the projects having a kind of the diversity. The, the, the diversity. It was uh, the fear of having an architectural zoo or architectural parade. Uh, this seemed to be coming true, and I think uh, it was only after we saw the more thorough presentations the next morning of each project, we realized the intensity of thought behind each project. And even though we perceived some of them as being folly-like, all of them were very thoughtfully prepared and we were extremely impressed by the presentations that we saw. So um, our hope is that also after that, we haven't seen the, the second round designs, the modifications, and I know Ours changed somewhat, and I think probably everyone else's will too. Uh, so I think they'll be in materiality and in these second round developments that kind of bring together so the diversity um, 
I think the diversity is both the, the good thing about it, but, and, but, but also the danger. It's, I cannot imagine to that to this extent. Not to this extent. I, you know and what? The, with these, with these un, ex, quite unexperienced architects. I mean, this is a group of really young architects. Right. The I, the idea of, of selling culture, I think, is is absolutely happening mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And it's not that this might not happen in the future, but I think right now, uh, uh, more experienced architects. Mm -hmm. um, Herzog and Aviron, uh, et cetera, are doing these high-level um, residential projects in the United States. And I think um, those have a certain inherent appeal to a developer. And I think that they want someone who has a certain level of experience and they, they can count on to produce these houses. The crazy thing about this developer, Mr. Chai, Mr. Tsai, mm -hmm. is his willingness to take on the risk of hiring a hundred architects who, many of whom, have not built a freestanding building before. I think the position of the architect relative to the overall size, um, you might say, has a kind of normal relationship to each individual project. In other words, it's a large project, hundred projects going simultaneous. But uh, with the exception of these two meetings in China, we don't feel it. It feels like a single family residence. Particular site, a job in a way like uh, no other job uh, or any other job. Uh, but at the same time, it's a job like no other job because we know that our neighbors are doing something extraordinary as well. You know, there was this, uh, we were talking to uh, you know, Fred at the New York Times, and uh, I had said, you know, that in a way, this, uh, if a genie came up and asked us, you know, what, what, uh, what, what what's the ideal project, of, uh, I'll give you three wishes, you know, uh, in architecture, what would it be? And it was kind of a, I think it was a mm -hmm. client that doesn't uh, try to tell us too much what to do, a schedule that's not uh, doesn't extend to too long and uh, what was the third? That well, we don't have to do construction yeah. documents right uh, but as soon as those things came true which they do in ordos in many ways uh, you realize the kind of naked feeling that you have that uh, there aren't these resistances that make a project have more depth uh, more resonance with the programs that the clients are bringing on board and we've had this experience before although I hate to admit it that when a client critiques our work, I mean, we work for typically very smart clients, their input, help, and when we have to redesign, when we have to rehash, revisit, we may be aggravated, but yeah. at the end it of the project, exactly, we look back at the end, we think, yeah, this is actually better than it was, you know, and so anytime we get those calls uh, that, you know, force us to make changes, I think we have to see it as an opportunity for uh, reevaluation. So the I, I think the ideal project is one uh, where we have some resistance. So, well, this is an experiment for us with less resistance, and we'll see what the result of that is.